The hardest thing to scale in a web application is the database. Therefore, in order to improve performance, a cache layer is often added to the stack. This can be pretty effective, improving performance while reducing the number of database queries. However, when it comes to software development, nothing ever comes for free. And caching itself has its own problems. The biggest one is stale data, which is when the data in your cache no longer matches what's in your database. This is solved through cache invalidation, but knowing when to flush your cache can be rather difficult, often being dictated by the type of data you're caching and the pattern you're using. To understand what those problems are and how to solve them, let's look at implementing the most common caching pattern there is, cache aside, which is also known as lazy loading. In this strategy, your application will request data in initially from the cache, and if there's a hit, return that data to the client. If the cache misses, however, then the database is instead queried for the data. This data is then both stored in the cache and returned to the caller. It's a pretty naive strategy, but it works rather effectively. To see this in action, let's go ahead and implement it. To go along with this video, I have a base project that I've created in Rust, which is a simple CRUD app for managing spells inside of a wizard's spellbook. The tech stack of this project is Rust and Axum for the HTTP server. For the database, we're using Postgres with SQL X, and for the cache, I'm choosing to use Redis. The actual tech stack itself doesn't matter too much. You could easily replace Redis with an in-memory cache if you wanted to. The benefit of using Redis, however, is that we're able to view the data that it contains using the CLI. In order to implement the cache size strategy, first clone down the project files using Git. Once completed, you can open up the project in your favorite text editor and then navigate over to the handlers slash read.rs file. Inside of this is a find by ID function, which is used by our HTTP handler to pull out spells from the database by their ID. Before we add in our cache, let's go ahead and see this endpoint in action. In order to run this, we're going to need an instance of Postgres. You can run an instance of this locally if you want to, but in order to give this a more real world feel, we're going to use the sponsor of today's video, Ivan, which will allow us to deploy both a Postgres and Redis instance for free. To deploy our instance, first head on over to the Ivan website at go.io ivan.io forward slash dreams of code or you can click the link in the description down below then you'll want to create a free ivan account using your preferred method once signed up you'll then want to create a new project for the application for me i'm going to call this spellbook with our project created we're then prompted to create a new service for this we want to create a postgres database so go ahead and click the service button upon doing so make sure to click the free plan and then choose the location closest to you Lastly, give your service a name and click the big blue create button. You'll then be shown your connection details. Here, copy the service URI to your clipboard and then head back on over to your project files. Inside this project, you'll find a .env file with a couple of environment variables left empty. You'll want to paste this service URI for the database URL mvar. Afterwards, we can then run our server using the cargo run command. This will automatically perform a database migration for us and insert eight rows into the spell table as well. If we send off a curl request to the localhost 3000 slash spells endpoint, we can retrieve all of the rows inside of our table. The handler that we looked at, which we're about to add caching to, is the slash spells slash ID endpoint, which allows us to pull out individual spells by their ID. We can measure the amount of time this request takes by heading on over to the main.rs file and enabling the debug logging level. Then if we rerun our server and send up two find by ID requests, we can see that it takes around 100 milliseconds for the request to process. You'll notice the first request was a little bit longer. That's because it's creating a prepared statement that is then reused by Postgres. Let's take a mental note of how long this took so we can compare it to the cache aside version that we're about to implement. To do so, navigate back to your editor and head on over to the handler slash read.rs file. Inside the find by ID function is where we're going to implement this strategy. The first step is to check the cache with the ID of the spell that we're looking for to see if it contains an entry. In our case, the Redis connection or cache is stored inside of the app state. Therefore, we can use the get method passing in the ID of the spell. This is what that would look like in the Redis CLI. Because this method can fail, we don't want it to break the execution flow of the function. Therefore, we'll use the unwrap or method to turn it into a none if it's an error. On success, this method returns an optional spell, representing whether or not there was an entry inside of the cache. Therefore, we can use the following lines to check if the spell exists, and if so, return it back to the client. If the result is none, then this will continue with the existing workflow. This is the first half of cache aside. The second half is that we store the result from the database inside of the cache. 
First, we'll check to see if we received a result from the database. If so, we can then write it to the cache using the set method, passing in the ID and the spell. This method also expects a couple more parameters. We'll set these to be none and false for the meantime. With that, we're writing to Redis as if we were doing the following command in the Redis CLI. We now have a basic implementation of cache aside. However, before we can run this code, we need an instance of Redis that we can connect to. Fortunately, Ivan has us covered again, as they provide a free version of Redis that we can use. To do so, head back on over to the Ivan dashboard and create a new Redis service. Again, be sure to select the free version and make sure it's a location close to you, preferably in the same place as Postgres. Once deployed, go ahead and copy the connection URI, then head back on over to the .env and add it to the Redis URL environment variable. With that, we're ready to run our code again using the cargo run command. When we send our first request to the spells slash one endpoint, you'll notice in the logs that we're retrieving the version in the database. However, if we make the same request again, this time it's coming from the cache. If we re-enable the debug log in order to measure the time this request takes, we can see that the response that pulls from the database takes about 250 milliseconds, with the cached response taking around 50. Therefore, by using this cache, we've reduced the amount of time it takes to pull out a record by 50% in the best case. However, in the worst case, we've actually increased it by two thirds. That's because instead of performing a single request to the database, we're now performing three requests in total, with the additional two going towards Redis. Fortunately, there is a way to improve this performance by concurrently writing to the cache and sending the result back to the client. We can do this in our code by using the following lines, which will perform our write to the cache in a spawned Tokyo task. Because this task takes place concurrently, the return of the result doesn't have to wait for the write to finish. Now, when we rerun our code, we can see that our first request, which was the worst case, only takes an extra 50 milliseconds when compared to before. So whilst there is still a performance hit, we've managed to reduce its impact. By the way, you may have noticed that every time we restart the server, it flushes all of the keys inside of the cache. This was done intentionally in order to simplify development during this first section, but you likely wouldn't want to do this in production, especially if you have multiple instances all reading from the same cache. However, removing this presents a problem with our implementation, cache invalidation, or the lack thereof. Basically, our keys will remain in the cache for as long as it exists. Therefore, in order to prevent our cache from consuming all of the available memory it has, we need to find a way to invalidate our keys. Fortunately, we have a couple of options. The first is to use an eviction policy, which tells Redis how to remove keys from the cache when the memory pressure climbs too high. If we head on back over to our Redis instance in Ivan, we can actually select one of the policies we want to use. Let's take a look at what each one of these does. The first of these policies is the evict all keys least recently used first, or LRU. This policy frees up memory by removing keys in the cache starting with those that were least recently used, with the definition of used being either written to or read from. The next policy is the evict only keys with expire set least recently used first. This is similar to above, but will only evict keys if they have an expiration set. We'll talk more about what that is shortly. Next, we have evict all keys in random order, which is basically a form of chaos. The next one is similar, but will only evict keys if they have the expiration set. Underneath this, we have evict only keys with expire set, with the shorter TTL keys being evicted first. This policy is good for prioritizing the eviction of keys that are likely going to be removed soon anyway. Next, we have evict using approximated LFUs among the keys with an expiry set. LFU stands for least frequently used, which differs slightly from LRU. LFU will prioritize keeping keys that have a lot of activity on them, instead preferring to evict those that haven't been used as much. The last policy also uses an LFU, but will evict any key regardless of whether it has an expiration set. Each of these policies has their own use case, depending on what data you're storing inside of the cache. In our case, the best policy is likely going to be either the evict all keys least recently used first, or the evict any key using approximated LFU. In this case, I'm gonna go with the least recently used first policy. By setting this, we've now prevented our instance from running out of memory. As well as setting an eviction policy, we can also tell our keys to expire after a certain period of time by setting an expiration on them. We can add this to our caching logic through the following code, which will cause our key to expire after 60 seconds. If we go ahead and run our code, then send up a couple of curl requests, we can see that our workflow is the same as before, first pulling from the database and then pulling from the cache. If I wait 60 seconds and send up another request, you'll see that this one is also reloaded from the database, showing that the key had been expired and removed. Setting an expiration is really useful if you want your keys to be removed after a period of time. 
Some common use cases for this are session tokens with authentication, or tracking usage for something such as rate limiting. Other times, they can be used to force the periodic refreshing of data. However, this can cause a common problem when it comes to caching. Let me show you what I mean. Here, I've changed the expiration to take place after 15 minutes. If I send up a GET request, we can see that our data has been cached as expected. However, if I send up a request to update the damage value of the spell, and then send a subsequent GET request, I receive the old value. This is because the data in the cache is now stale, and no longer matches what's found in the database. In many applications, this is unacceptable and therefore has to be resolved. Unfortunately, using cache aside only doesn't solve this issue. Instead, we need to use another pattern, known as write-through caching. When a write occurs in your database, such as updating a record, a write will also occur to the cache at the same time. Let's go ahead and implement this inside of our update handler. You can navigate there by heading over to the handler slash update.rs file inside of the project. Inside of this file, we have our handler function called update, which accepts an ID of the spell we want to update and an update request body which contains our damage value. This function is where we want to apply write through caching. To do so is rather simple. All we have to do is write to the cache once we've successfully written to the database. We can do this again by using the trusty set method on our cache instance. Again, making sure to set the expires field. However, there's another improvement we can make here. In a write heavy workflow, this would end up creating a lot of keys that may not be used. And if we have an expiration policy that uses an LRU, then this can be problematic. Instead, we only want to write this key if it already exists in the cache. We can do that in Redis by using the xx option of the set method, which will only write the value if the key already exists. We can do this in our update function by adding in the following code. Now let's go ahead and test it out. If I send a put request to a spell that has been cached, the next time I request it, we'll see the updated damage value. We can also see this updated value inside of the Redis instance. However, if I send a put request to a spell that hasn't been cached, if we check our Redis instance, we can see that no key exists. But the update did apply to the model inside of Postgres. This shows that our write-through caching logic is working as expected. However, we are suffering a performance hit due to the fact that we're writing to the cache as well. We can improve this by writing to the cache concurrently inside of a Tokyo task, similar to how we did it in our cache aside logic. This gives us our caching implementation without causing a performance hit to our users. With that, we've managed to solve the stale data issue when it comes to our update handler. However, we have one last handler that can still be affected. This is the delete handler, which is used to remove a spell from the database. In order to prevent stale data, we also need to delete this from the cache as well. You can do this using the del method of the cache instance. However, rather than showing you how to do this, I'm going to let you implement this yourselves. Let me know how you get on in the comments down below. With that, we've managed to add caching into our application stack, whilst also addressing some of the problems that can occur when doing so. As a final note, caching isn't always the silver bullet it's claimed to be. Most of the time, you should look at adding indexing to your database tables as a first step. If you'd like to know more about when to cache and when not to, then let me know in the comments down below, and I'll do another video on it. I want to give a big thank you to Ivan for sponsoring this video. They have a really cool data platform with support for a lot of services. Without them, this video wouldn't have been as good, so please do check them out using the referral link down below. Otherwise, I want to give a big thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.